So Matthew 25, 1 to 13. A very interesting scripture. I'll go ahead and start it out. It says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins. Now notice the virgins there. These are pure. So all ten of them were pure. That's the interesting part. That's the part really got me. As I begin to go out and explain more. Which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Now we know Jesus is implying the Lord here. Now the lamps is obviously you know, dealing with us. And then the oil is the character that keeps the lamp burning, you know. And the light. So it goes on to say, And five of them were wise and five were foolish. So apparently ten of these virgins were really after God at first. So it showed. And... Um, Foolish there in the Greek actually means either godless in the origin is secret. So that means that they showed like they were for God, but in secret in their heart, they weren't for God. So that's what that actually, if I broke it down that way. So these ones that were, I guess you call them, I guess, fake. <laughs> I don't know another word for it. But then we have the wise. And the wise were the prudent, the thoughtful, the cautious, the mindful of one's interest. So that means they were mindful of God's interest. So we're getting this part where we can get that agape love, huh? And feel it a little bit. So inside these things on it, we see the wise was there, and we got the foolish. And I'll continue on that. It says, they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. So the interesting part, you know, they didn't have that oil. That oil was there to keep their, you know, keep their lamp burning, shine bright. We know it was the oil for light, not the oil for the anointing. See, I'll explain that here in a second. So inside these areas, it went on to say, But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, he delayed. They all slumbered and slept. Now the interesting part, slept there can mean in the Greek to be indifferent to one's salvation. So that means they were starting out well other than not taking the oil. But if they never would have slept and slumbered, they could have thought about going to buy oil earlier you see what i'm saying so because they end up doing that now we know that you know that usually means to fall out dealing with it now it continues on to say and at midnight there was a cry made behold the bridegroom coming go ye out to meet him then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps so trim there is actually um to make ready to make prepared so that means they were already watching, they were already ready, their things are getting ready to happen. And the foolish said unto the wise, give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. Now the interesting part is gone out there means quench. Well, quench the spirit, right? So what happened, give us some of your oil. Well, they're talking about character oil. You can't give character oil. I, you know, I wish that was the case. You know, I've tried that before, it doesn't work. But you can give anointing oil. See, like anointing wise, and anointing can rub off, but characters were sustained. So we begin to see it that um, they started to say, you know, our lamps have been gone out. Now, notice how they got the fear as soon as the bridegroom came. In order to meet him, they had to go out and show their secret. That means, like, if they had their lamps burning or if they didn't. So that's where he goes on to say, when he comes back, everything begins to pan out. It comes, everything gets shown. So. In this, he goes on to say, now, now, but the wise answered, saying, no, not so, lest there be not enough for us, and you, but go ye out, rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. Now, the interesting part, we, we know that, you know, it says that, you know, you can buy truth. It talks about that. I think it's in um, Proverbs. Let me see if I can get to it. Proverbs 23, 23. It's kind of like what's explained the scripture a lot more. Hold on, let me get to it. Buy the truth and do not sell it. Wisdom, instruction, and insight as well. So instruction is discipline and correction. Um, you know, chastisement. And wisdom is obviously from that in the Lord and insight as well. So when you buy the truth, the truth is that oil, that light. Because we know Jesus is the light of the world. It says do not sell it. So as they get ready to say, you know, they say go out to them and buy from them. So this type of oil, it seemed like, you, since you can't buy the character oil, what they were buying was the anointing, you know? So they were thinking the anointing oil, or the anointing was gonna save them. And what he was saying is the anointing is supposed to change the heart on the inside, not just come upon, it's supposed to come on the inside and change you from the inside out, not the outside in. 
So in these areas, we begin to see this quite a bit that, you know, he kind of goes through a lot of different parables. I'm not going to go into all those. That could take a long time, <laughs> long time to explain those things deep down. Now, we know buying is a purchase. So the right type of oil to buy comes with the, with the price. So the character of God comes with the price. Let me tell you, it comes with a big price. The cost of the true oil comes with the price. The cost of other things don't necessarily come with the price. It can, but a lot of times it's given without change. So it's just a lot of times that basket falls and it crushes the person if they don't have the inner anointing. So then we begin to go on and he goes on to say, And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to, to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open up to us. So, so notice how they're pretty confident. Lord, Lord. You know, like, you're my Lord. <laughs> and it went on to say, But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. That means perceive you. So it didn't mean he did not know them, because notice how he didn't say never. He didn't say never in this scripture. He said, I do not know you. So these people, ten virgins, they were right. And as time went, they began to stagnate. So, and as that began to happen, eventually the Lord must have gave them to the way, because you don't hear about them going through a lot. See, a lot of times how you know if the Lord is beginning to, if he's molding, he's still doing things, it's not necessarily that things don't happen inside of life, things do, and he molds you through it, you see. Um, it doesn't mean that you're going to go on forever with things happening. What I mean is that he uses circumstances to mold us into his character. And without that, we cannot grow. We just can't grow. Because you come to find out that one day everything changes like this. If we take this parable right here, one day all of a sudden in the bridegroom, he, he appeared. Can you imagine even circumstances? What about people's callings? What about people's things and, and everything you have to do? One moment later, everything changes. And you find out whether or not you've been built through it or you wasn't later on. It's better off to get built through it. And if someone goes, hey, never going to happen. And when it happens, they, what are they going to say then? <laughs> what are they going to say? So what happens now? When it happens, the person that went through and built in the Lord is going to have that peace of heart to be able to take it through. A lot of times the circumstances come and... They begin to mold us into more of his image. And like I said, it produces great habits. Great habits. So we don't want to go into these type of habits where after a while they begin to... That usually means that they pretty much went the opposite way completely. You know. So this is kind of like... I mean, if we apply this to a parable-wise um, to churches, you know, not every church, but some churches, you know, where they only operate in certain things. Like, let's say just gifts and if people rely on that over sustaining relationship, those gifts will drag them in hell, you see. So with those things on it, you know, the more I dive in closer to God, the more I keep getting this realization. It's like the perception keeps widening out. I keep seeing it that, you know, I've known it before. Have you ever had something you know it before, but something just opens up again? It's like you get another revelation. It's like you know that you know, and the next thing you know, you know that you know something else now. It's deeper, and it's deeper. It's like deep, deeper, and deepest. You know, deep calls out the deep, you know. Let's just talk about deep, you know. Let's keep talking about that. So, so for instance, on this, as it begins to die down, what happens now, you know, you begin to get more and more revelation of who he is. So it's all in him. So as I begin to get that, it draws me closer to him in that relationship. Now, that's usually where every door opens. If we see that in the book of Revelation, I won't go there, but it talks about Philadelphia Church, right? He says, you have kept my word. That's the Logos word. You have kept it in your heart. You have not denied me. That means you know the character. Like, you have not denied me. You have kept these. You have observed my word. And he said, now I'm going to open a door that no man can shut. And if I shut the door, no man can open it. So what he was trying to say was, all this stuff means everything when it comes to that simple, basic thing. What makes it hard is consistency. I'll say that again. What makes it hard is consistency. That's what faithfulness is. That's why... Um, uh, faith is a fruit of the Spirit because that means actually consistency. So the Holy Spirit's the only one that can give us consistency. That means um, keep me on the schedule with God. That means like to draw away with God. He's the only one that can make me do that. If I begin to do it, I begin to get burnt out. Why? Because it's all my own works, not Him. So in those ways, you see that the Philadelphia church didn't want to. You see them say, you held fast to my patience. Now I really thought about that. 
And um, he began to say, like, my patients, not your patients. And I'm like, you mean my patient? So what was happening was, if you look it up deeper, it means to abide in him and him and you. So what happens now, as you go through that process, God molds you into abiding in him. In you, you know, you and him and him and you. And when that begins to happen, that word dwells there richly. Now, I, you know, I heard someone say, I think it was because I sometimes have the sermon thing, well, actually a lot of times, because I really like it, how these old-fashioned teachers, man, they can get deep, they can get deep. And one of them was saying, the word says not to have the word of God dwelling, but richly dwelling. And it really got me to think, wow, richly means abundantly, always, constant, overflowing. That means like my meditation becomes that consistently doesn't matter what attack, it, like, it becomes a part of me completely. And it really got me thinking, wow, like, richly. You know how much we can do with richly dwelling in the Word of God? And I kept saying it so much, I know Chelsea, you know? You know, I <laughs> kept saying richly. And, you know, I ended up being quiet out there a second, of course. But, you know, <laughs> I had to take a little further. But, you know, I started to really think about that, though, because that guy was really just speaking some simple things, but, like, it was hitting me like, Wow, I never looked at it like that. Like, I looked at it like that, but I had the light bulb go off. And it's like, these wise that were here doing this apparently had it richly dwelling because they knew exactly what to do and they weren't nervous when this coming was happening. So, you know, as we begin, you know, we, we get through this, dealing with it, 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 the foolish as well. They were the false who enjoyed benefits without having the true love for Jesus. So the wise, they were willing to persevere and go because the agape love is unconditional. That means I'm going to come across things that God tells me I ain't going to want to do. And it, it's, just, it's just how it is because our flesh comes against the spirit. And what happens, if I have agape love, I will do it anyways. You know, So that agape love pushes me to do that. Filial love will not push me to do that. I'll have a strong emotional connection and all who hate Jesus, I hate them now. You see? So that's really what happens. But agape will go, I love my enemies. You see so I can still love the Muslims, even though they have a different faith than me. I can still treat them well. If they don't want to change, they don't have to change. But at least I try. You see what I'm saying? So in these areas, that's for God to do. So these people, apparently the foolish, they were going and enjoying the benefits of God. It's, you know, his unconditional love gives us all things. Whether it's right or wrong. I mean, he can do that. His unconditional means that I can be in my worst time and he loves me still no matter what. It's consistent. His nature never changes. The world changes, but his nature stays exactly the same. And those are the things we have to focus on in, in everything that we go through. We have to recognize God's nature doesn't change. That means his goodness is still his goodness. Even through the bad, still his goodness. Even through the good, through the human, he doesn't change. So his nature is literally what it is. I think if we recognize that a lot more, we, wouldn't, we won't doubt, for instance, certain things that go on. Because his goodness is his goodness. That means in every little thing, his goodness is still his goodness. He's still doing it all for the good. So... You know, it's the same way it works with this kindness. So these are many different sides of God. A whole other sermon over here. We can get into many different faces of God. It's like many different names, you know, his character. Because name in the Hebrew meant character. So he had many different names for many different characters of himself. And that's just a, a whole other jar right there to open. But we'll stick to this. But yeah, so they could have had filial love. We don't know. They could have had an emotional connection. I mean, you know, I know I was saying this earlier, but you know, some people, you know, they can... Going like, I can feel God, I can feel God, but there ain't no, nothing after that. But they can always feel God, and that, that can be a filial love. It's an emotional connection, and God's going to get that because it's unconditional love. But what justifies us before God is the agape love that we have in Him. We get closer to Him, He gets it. Me, I can demonstrate it towards my neighbors now. And so, in these areas, you know, kind of leads me into my next segment on it. What is peace of heart? Because you know that these wise had a peace of heart, and you know that the foolish didn't, right? That's soon that happened. You know, we don't know exactly what they had before that, but peace of heart is contentment. And through it, we can press on without struggle inside. So what I mean by this is, it doesn't matter what happens in my circumstances, I can be content. Have you ever noticed sometimes you can go and you can get something, and it's like, but I want to get this, this, and this too. And it's like you begin to go for, ah, I get this. And it's like, oh, but do I want to get this now too? And it's like it begins to escalate. That would be a sign of not contentment. You know? That would be a sign of more of a, um, the pressure's on. You know, the enemy is really beginning to work. So that will rob me of my peace. But contentment's something that you go and you get and you're like, okay, 
for instance, let's say if you have enough money now to get another, you know, new vehicle in this, this, and this. And now you just, you're on it. It's like, I'm going to do it. Okay. And the next thing you know, it's like, well, maybe that's not good enough. I want to go up and do this. Or I look at someone else's life. It's like, I want what they have. I want this. That's what gets us out of contentment. It's usually comparison. So in this, we can press on because if we're content, like Paul said, I was content in every circumstance. Well, how did he get that way? He went through a lot of circumstances and learned and did it differently. So in these areas, we find contentment, you know, through the word, obviously. But through the word produces great experience in God, especially through our experiences in the world. And helps to guide us on the right path, not the wrong one. So that's why it's very important that we obviously have the word dwelling. But in these areas, we begin to find true contentment. Now, it goes on to say, you know, I went on to write it down. The world can give a gift that looks like one that God on the outside, they look the same, but inside completely different. What I mean is that, you know, anything can get given, but the inside is what makes it the peace of heart, you see. So, um, for instance, it can't, yeah, it can't give peace of heart. The world can only give, you know, the world can give marriage, money, everything else. On the outside, it will look the same, but on the inside, the world cannot give peace of heart. That's why Jesus said that I come to give you peace, not as the world gives. And a lot of times you don't notice that at first on, you know. But sometimes you do. A lot of times you get that heart confirmation, you know, in God. It says you need you need peace of heart to enjoy whatever you have. Even when there is no trouble, you still won't be able to have peace of heart. See, that's the interesting. That's the part that kind of got me. Was even if there's no trouble around me, I can't enjoy things right if I don't have the peace of heart. You know, if I don't have that first in my heart, no wonder why it says, seek his kingdom and his righteousness. That's what gives you peace of heart. And all things will be added. If I get everything, we see a lot of celebrities today. I mean, they get everything and they're, they're going through torment. You know how I know? Conflict. What a person gives more is what they're dealing with. More. You see what I'm saying? Let's say if you get someone that's peaceful, it's like, I don't want this. I don't want to go there like this. They're obviously dealing with peace. But if someone's going, I'm about that, I'm going to beat this person down, I'm going to beat this person, I'm going to beat them, I'm going to jump over here, I'm going to jump over here. And, and, and then that person's jumping, and it's like, you're just getting crazy. I can usually know that what I need to grow from in that, you see. And like what I mean by that, it's not necessarily like seeing something that's triggered something a little bit. I'm not talking about that. Anybody can get triggered. I'm talking about how it disturbs their whole day. Like, like you know, that trigger is done for. It's like, my day is ruined. You know, it's like, it's like one of those things. And it's like those areas, we need the peace of heart in all things. You know, like I've said before, I've had a lot of cash in the hand before. Did not give me peace of heart. But I've had very little, and I've had peace of heart. It's very remarkable because it even shows the rich man and the poor man, right? The poor man had the peace of heart. But the rich man didn't. He thought he did. Because after a while, it becomes a delusion. You can come to find out, okay, have you seen these... Uh, Things on. I try not to pay too much attention to it, but okay, you, you got like a lot of things going on. Let's say boxing wise right now, they're just fighting one another. It's a constant, like conflict. You're like, no, I got peace over here. I'm good. It's like, no, you don't, because you just done them to someone else. You want to, it, It's the same. It's a reflection. So when they're going and they're attacking, attacking, it's the same with ministry. They attack, attack, attack. What happens now? There's no peace in the heart. That's why the attack is happening. You see. In order to get that, when you have peace in the heart, you won't feel like attacking. You're like, there ain't no point of that. Let's just get over this and go. You see what I'm saying? It's like one of those things. And the Lord fights that battle. But um, there's something very significant that Prophet T.B. Joshua said. I remember I was on CNN. And um, obviously before he died. <laughs> you know. But in, in 2014, I think it was. But he was saying like, he's like, I can go out when I want. I can sleep fine. I can do this, I can do ministry, I can do that, because I have a peace of heart. He said, if I didn't have that, I couldn't do anything. I'd stress over so much. I'd lay awake and I'd do this. I'd stress, have all these pressures. He said, God is the only one that can give that. So, you know, that kind of really hit home when it comes to that. It's because a lot of times people say, I have a peace of heart, you know, but not really understand what that really means. Peace of heart is contentment. That means I'm content, God, where I'm at. Do what you want to do. That's what that means. Because contentment doesn't compare with one another. Contentment doesn't want what one another has. Contentment is your own lot. What God gives me, what he says I can have, I can have, right? What he gives me, I can have. What he does, he is righteous in all things. And I, I come to realize when you throw off everything else in you, and you think that way in Jesus, everything begins to go off the shoulders. 
So in these areas, I wrote down some more of it. Yeah, even when they're the other, there's no trouble, you know, be able to have peace of heart. It says, if you have not much of the peace of heart, he can give you, you know, well, let me see how I wrote this down. I was writing this so quick. Oh, yeah, yeah. If you don't have much, the peace of heart will give you what you need in all things. So the number one thing we need not to forget is the peace of heart. That's everything when it comes into it. So it gets me to the next discussion on it. You can have breakthrough. This is very interesting. And I, I, we've seen it a lot when it comes to a lot of different things. You can have many different levels of breakthrough, but never have the peace of heart. Because this is what happens. God's peace of heart comes from his ways. So here's the thing. Someone can have major breakthrough from God's kindness and love, but yet I can walk away without taking the peace of heart. I can leave it over here in the chair. Unless I come back to that chair and grab it and walk with it. So it doesn't necessarily mean that God isn't with a person. What it means is that that area is now being blocked from him being with. So really what happens is how we even get to the peace of heart. It doesn't just happen instantly. I want to say that. Peace of heart, you know, it takes progress. It takes time because what happens is in order to have a peace of heart, the only one Jesus, you have to recognize certain things, conflicts going on in your side. So what I mean by that, first thing coming, you start recognizing insecurities in certain ways that maybe you haven't seen or maybe that you have, it's come back up. You begin to analyze that and go, what's it going to take for me to release this? And God begins to give you, pretty much map it out for you. And as you begin to do it, you have more of a peace of heart. So in some of these areas, that, that, that's very important because you see a lot of people getting breakthrough. Like I'm talking big breakthrough. I'm talking about they're a millionaire the next day. Like breakthrough. You know, they get prayed for the next day and they're a millionaire. But they don't have a peace of heart. And what happens, they might be a millionaire and doing everything right. But now their struggle, their focus is in that money. In how to make more and do it. Even if they're doing everything right, it's still in the money making, not in God. So we see this quite a bit in many different areas, especially around the world as well. Peace always wants peace, like what I said earlier. It wants unity and love. Conflict will run after comparison or conflict. So conflict, it will run after it. So, you know, as we grow in these things, you come to realize a lot of things you're saying even more of it. And to realize it. And it kind of feels like you get lazy on it, but it's not really like that. It's just more like it's it's here today and gone tomorrow, right? Hallelujah. <laughs> it's here today and gone tomorrow. So, you know, let's go ahead and go to Philippians 4 and 9. Actually, 4 6. I should have probably already been there. 4 6 to 7. It says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which pass, passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. This is how you separate the hearts and minds, because they are two different things. You have a peace of heart in your, you know, in your heart, and I have a peace of mind. What I mean is, in your heart, you can have this tug going. I'm gonna keep going no matter what. You see what I'm saying? That word is sustaining you, but in the mind, there's attacks. But he's saying, this is how you get mind and your hearts peaceful. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, your requests are made known unto God. So be careful for nothing, that's releasing. And how do I release other than make it all known before God? It's pretty much something one man of God said, uh, I watched it a long time ago. And he's like, you know what I do when I pray? I just go inside the other room and tell God everything about my day. He's like, I just do it. I just release it to him. I tell him the things that haven't happened yet. I tell him the things that I wish that maybe I wanted done or this, this, and this. Ask him to help me. I ask him to do this. And, and he's like, that's what I do. Well, that's exactly what he's saying to do, you know. Um, when you do that to God, you know, and then you give him thanks for what he's already doing and what he's going to do. This is what gives you peace. So now we begin to go down this nine. Yeah, Philippians 4, 9. Those things which... You have both learned and received and heard and seen in me. Do and the God of peace shall be with you. Now this is talking about Paul. Now obviously the reason why he's talking about this is because of his character. His ways. Because of his ways, he instantly had peace all the time. So then he goes, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me has flourished again. Wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Let's see. Yep, yep, I keep on going. 
Let me go ahead and get out the King James. I'm over here trying to rephrase it, and I'm lost it over here. The hath and thou's and got about every point of it on there. Yeah, I'll start in 10. I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever circumstance, whatever the circumstances. I know what it has what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in every situation. Whether well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things, you know, through Christ who gives me strength. So, in these areas we see there's a secret to being content. And um, a lot of times he says, I can do all this through him who gives me strength, which is obviously through Christ. So, really the secret is very simple. And like I said, it's not always easy. It's not always easy. I don't know why sometimes it can just try to be overcomplicated. I mean, I've dealt with that. I've done it myself. But what I'm saying is it can be like, no, you got to do like this 10-step thing. You gotta, you gotta put them all out there. You gotta be like this, this, and you gotta see the right words. You gotta see this right, right. It's like as if we're taking God's place to replace His words with our words. Like our words are gonna mean something. <coughs> you know. So inside these areas, it's better off to do it very simple. I, I remember Moses going on to say, "Lord, I pray you heal me." And he was talking about his sister Miriam dealing with that. He's the most simplest thing, and God instantly done it. He sent her outside for seven days, but I mean, he still done it. You know. But inside these areas, I mean, that was probably a repercussion of it. But here's the thing. Very simple. He didn't go, I pray that you heal it from, you know, it's like there's all these extra things. Notice one thing that Moses had, though, the relationship. The reason why I teach a relationship so much is because it doesn't happen overnight. <laughs> it has to be reminded. It has to be cultivated. you know, you got to get it deep down in your heart so that way every single time something goes on, that springs up inside you. Relationship. This is how I do this. You see what I'm saying? And you go further and further. And this is how you grow in the Lord. So I wish it happened overnight. It'd be easy. It'd be really easy there. You know? But it doesn't always. So in these areas, we begin to see this stuff a lot. You know, he, he began to, he learned what it was like to have plenty. That means he was rich. I believe it. I definitely believe it. I believe, you know, many times he walked in a place and he had plenty. I think the part where he said he was in one was not necessarily that when he was out doing things. I don't think he was in one. I believe God supplied every need. I believe when he was in one is when he went to the jail cell. You see, he had nothing. I mean, if you look up some of the history on that, it's, it's disgusting. It's bad. You know, it's just raw, you know. So he found out how to be content just inside some bombs, not really moving too much. Maybe enough to write a letter. But, I mean, this stuff is right out in the open. You know, it's possible for rain to even get inside. I mean, it's very, it's very crazy, very crazy. So in these areas, this stuff right here is what has to be first, the peace of heart. And you know, many times I ask God, I'm like, how does this work like this? You know, like, it looks like a person having a piece of heart like this, but what's going on? And you come to find out, like, like, you know what happened with the foolish, right? It can be in secret. And you know, you can put a big smile, take a great camera, you know, take a great pig. It can be like, man, that person looks like they're doing great. You come to find out when you get involved, and you're just like, whoa, what's going on? So many things are going on. And inside these areas on it, that's why it's very important. The peace of heart starts in the, the inner, the inner anointing. So like I said before, that I believe the outer anointing is not necessarily anointing. I think it's the gift of the Holy Spirit that's been anointed by him. It's the giftings of God. The inner anointing is how we touch those giftings from the anointing that comes within. It gives us the strength to be able to push them out. So that's what we need the most is that inner anointing. And find out many people in heaven didn't really do too much, but they had an abiding presence in God. And they'll get so much more than some people doing everything here. You know, and they say, How'd you get it? I spend a lot of time with God, you see. So, you know, a lot of those things on it's opposite the way that we think. Here we can think success is measured by everything that you want. In heaven, it's not measured by that. It's everything that you give unto God. So that's really what success is. So Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your word.